So we're running a little bit late, but I'm going to try and uh, jump into this. So I'm Teresa. I'm the chair. Um, I'm going to be going first. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate, almost like this close to graduating from UC Riverside in critical dance studies. I have my MA from uh, University of Mexico in Albuquerque in dance history. Uh, I been a flamenco dancer since I was like seven years old. So, but I also grew up doing folklorico. So, the comment about the folklore, I, I love the connections and we make those connections. Um, so, what we're going to do is, I think I'll just go first, and then I'm going to introduce everybody else as we go. We'll do all the questions and answers, whatever at the end. Okay, trying to keep this on time. So I have, I have like pictures. It's not really that. So my paper, well, I keep using this title because I write about Madrid a lot, so Cuando Sube Mi Barca, uh, Mapping Space and Time in Madrid Flamenco. So, in this paper, I will examine the tangled roots of flamenco in Madrid from the 18th century through the 20th, uh, from migrations from Andalusia and immigrations from South America, Africa, and Asia. As this is the rudimentary form of a much longer chapter in my dissertation, this, the presentation only lightly sketches some of these pathways and digs a bit more deeply into a few. I will pay particular attention to the rise of, in, to prominence of Madrid as a flamenco site in the 50s and 60s, with the era of the Taulaos and the post-Franco negotiation of a unique brand of Madrileño flamenco in the 80s and 90s. The history of flamenco in Madrid, always already framed as a displaced regional form, parallels patterns of movements of different groups of people through the city, which absorbs, rejects, or reframes the various alternative Spanish identities and or otherness represented by these bodies. During the Franco regime, the state encouraged and subsidized the use of flamenco as the representative form of Spanish national identity, which included a neocolonial co-optation of Latinos in the Americas as satellite Spaniards. The influx of non-Spanish flamenco artists at the end of the century raised the question, who was allowed to visually or sonically represent flamenco and by extension Spain? Unlike most European capital cities, Madrid's status as capital has historically been something foisted upon the city, sometimes rather forcefully, rather than organically developed through commerce or culture. Founded as a Muslim fort in the 9th century, the name coming from the Arabic Mayrit, meaning rich in water, and conquered by Catholic Spain in the 11th. The Habsburg dynasty moved the capital to Madrid from nearby Toledo in the 16th century. In the early 18th century, the freshly installed French Bourbon dynasty implemented a centralizing urban development project, which reflected the centralizing and consolidating policies of the Bourbons in general. A distinct Madrileño identity slowly began to foment around the two main central districts called Madrid de los Asturias, de los Austrias, after the Austrian Habsburgs, and Madrid de los Bourbones, to distinguish the two different eras of development. As these urban era areas densified and developed, distinct subcultures and fashions simultaneously germinated in the newly cobbled streets. The most distinct of these was machismo. Dance historian Beatriz Martinez de Fresno referred to machismo as, quote, a xenophobic and self-affirming reaction of city people, which began as a way of making fun of those that followed French fashions, unquote. The tension between the afrancesados, those in the court and fashionable circles in Madrid, who followed French fashion and politics began to fall out of favor with the Bourbon court with the 1789 French Revolution. In 1799, the court of Carlos uh, IV issued a royal decree, quote, that prohibited theatrical performances in any language other than Spanish and by actors, singers, or dancers who were not Spaniards or naturalized citizens, unquote. Martinez del Fresno points out that this decision, quote, has frequently been interpreted as a patriotic interventionist gesture but it should be not forgotten that economic questions weigh heavily among the king's immediate motivations." Unquote. The figure of the Majo exemplified the trend in, post, in the post-war period through their exaggerated form of dress that emphasized a new Spanish identity in opposition to the French styles that had dominated before the war. Jose de Las Vega located the first definition of the term Majo in a dictionary from 1734, which described the Majo as, quote, a man who affects handsomeness and valor in his actions and words. Commonly so-called are those who live in the quarters near the court, unquote. 
thus associating the Majo with Madrid in particular and with the less affluent neighborhoods of the central urban area. The Majos and their female counterparts, the Majas and sometimes the Manolas are kind of included in there, came to symbolize an urban subculture linked to the center of Madrid and with the like, lower middle and lower classes. The female Manola with her large peineta, hair comb, and the black lace mantilla, the long headscarf, came to symbolize for foreigners, especially the influx of romantic era tourists from Britain, France, Spanish national identity. These figures were also associated with many uh, forms of song and dance that flamencologists refer to as pre-flamenco, or pre-flamenco, such as sainetes, tonadillas, seguirillas, and the dance form now called escola bolera. By the 19th century, another dictionary definition of majo reflected a shift in the use of the term, calling it, quote, the name especially in Andalusia to designate a townsperson that was differentiated from others by his particular dress, by his proud comportment, and by his manners full of grace and effortlessness, by his luxurious costume full of adornments, and by his brave handsomeness and air of toughness, unquote. Here, the term is now associated with Andalusia in particular, and by extension, the Andalusian transplants in Madrid. Las Vegas further cited historian and linguist Julio Caro, who claimed that the Majo, quote, is the special product of certain neighborhoods in Madrid, unquote. Las Vegas pinpointed one of these neighborhoods as that of La Batiez, located southeast of the palace and south of the Plaza Mayor, in Puerta del Sol. Oh, yes. Ooh. He emphasized a connection between flamenco and the neighborhood, writing that, quote, in the history of Madrid Flamenco, the neighborhood of La Batiez, was always the most important nucleus. Until recent times, it contributed the largest roster of Madrileño artists, being their preferred residential place, including Gitanos and Andalusians. It comprises such flamenco areas as Toledo and Embajadores Streets, El Rastro, Arganzuela, Meson de Paredes. La Batiez has represented the genuine and the cool of Madrid, transmitting its styles, its sayings, and its grace through the singing, dance, and guitar. So he, repeat, he goes back to La Batiez a bunch in his history of Madrid. That's like his, his favorite area, which hey, is one of my favorite areas too. The author argued that the neighborhood, quote, created and fomented the nighttime celebrations of Fandangos, the antecedent of Andalusian flamenco huerga, like no other place, unquote. He asserted that Madrid was, quote, the homeland of the Fandango, unquote, and the nighttime bailes de candil or candle dances that took place in the wee hours of the evening long before electric lights artificially prolonged Madrid nightlife. In the, the mid-19th century, flamenco came to the foreground of Spanish subculture, especially in the sketches, visual, and prose of mostly French and British romantic tourists to Spain, like Charles Sevillier, George Poro, and Prosper Mermé. Around the same time, starting in Sevilla and Andalusia, cafes sprang up, the Cafés Cantantes, in urban areas, showcasing flamenco alongside other novelties and popular musical forms. Uh, flamencologist Angel Alvarez Caballero cited the first notice of a flamenco show to, uh, in Madrid from 1853 at a salon called Benzano, located off the Plaza Santa Ana. Which, go up here. So, here, Plaza del Angel, Plaza Santa Ana, right up here. From notices like this and advertisements for flamenco parties and performances at other cafes, Alvarez Caballero argued that, quote, in the middle of the 19th century in Madrid, some fairly professional flamencos mm -hmm. were already performing. And although the bailaora was not yet the star, she made a no notable impression in the chronicles, not written evidently, this is his term, by those in the know, unquote. The author located the surge in flamenco as a fashion in Madrid in the 1880s, noting, however, that this surge also coincided with an anti-flamenco backlash. They, anti-flamenquismo that would find expression in the Madrid intellectual circle of the Generación del 98, or the Generation of 98, with uh, Namuno and uh, Pio Barroja. At that time, and through the early years of the 20th century, Madrid flamenco was still largely dominated by Andalusian transplants. Alvarez Caballero mentioned, uh, there's a couple of dancers, I'm gonna kind of skip through this because we're running short, but uh, he emphasized that there's a uh, Café de la Magdalena off of Tirso de Molina, which attracted a lot of the big names at this time. And people like Estampillo, and there's a couple of other dancers that moved from the south into their residence there. And it really kind of starts to kick up uh, early 20th century when you have uh, Los Gabrieles and Villa Rosa, again, off of Plaza Santa Ana that come up and that become centers of Flamengo and Madrid. So getting back to the theme of the conference, uh, in terms of roots, you can't get away from you know, the Spanish Roma, the Gitanos, and the Andalusians that dominated the mix of flamenco artists 
anywhere at that time, the, the roster. Uh, and basically in Madrid, they started to kind of take, take root in La Papiesse, uh, which is interesting because in, according to local legend, the area was, and there's some argument about this, whether the area was a center for like the, the Jewish community and conversos in the, the Reconquista Spain or not. Uh, I think just the fact that those stories exist reflect kind of this like social cultural memory of that area as a, a place where cultures mixed, so whether or not there's actual historical evidence. So in addition to these internal others, the Roma, the Jews, and the Muslims, circulation of people between Spain in general and its colonies had existed throughout the colonial era. With the disaster of 1898, immigration to Spain from these areas decreased, and the world wars and the Spanish Civil War spurred an exodus from Spain. However, in Madrid, the population doubled between 1900 and 1931, due mostly to the onset of urbanization and industrialization in greater Spain. On the municipal level, the introduction of the Metro Line in 1919 created the conditions necessary for internal circulations of commuters. In the 1950s, some returned to Spain as did international tourists from the United States, Britain, and other European countries. Madrid became a central hub for tourists to Spain. For flamenco, this meant the explosion of the tablao scene with uh, new opportunities for work for many flamenco artists. Regional migrations brought people and artists from the south to work in the center and more from rural areas to the urban nucleus. In addition to the historic neighborhoods of La Vapiés, Tirso de Molina, and the Lucian Enclave sprang up in the periphery of Madrid in Vallecas and Orcasitas. Immigration ebbed and flowed throughout the rest of the Franco dictatorship, with most non-Europeans hailing from Latin American countries. The regime promoted the idea of Hispanidad, a sort of shared identity between Spain and its former colonies demonstrated through language and culture. Ministry of Tourism sent flamenco artists to tour throughout Latin America and touted flamenco artists hailing from these countries like Mexicans Luis Hio, Manolo Vargas, and Roberto Jimenez, and Venezuelan Tatiana Reina as demonstrations of Hispanidad. During the 60s and 70s, many non-Spanish flamenco artists, dancers in particular, resided in Madrid for varying periods of time, both to study and to perform. As early as, eight, as 1968, the room logs for the Amor de Dios dance studios in the center of Madrid regularly feature names of American dancers like Pablo Rodarte and Japanese dancers like Morico. The Franco period also saw the Franco period also saw a renewed nationalist project with the regime attempting to promote Madrid as the cultural and political center, but also as a regionally neutral center, symbolic of a distilled Spanishness untainted by regional affiliation. The surge of flamenco activity in the capital, not only in Tablaos, but also in theaters and festivals during this time, reflected the regime's simultaneous appropriation of the form as symbolic of Spain in its entirety, and not just of Andalusia. Like the Bourbons, Franco attempted to erase many regional micronationalisms, most no notably those of the Catalan and Busquera. Even the development of the railway system, with every track leading to Madrid, reflected this forceful focus on the capital. The flamenco identity became a facet of Spanish identity, like bullfighting or paella, used to sell the idea of Spain to tourists and to Spaniards alike. In this consolidation of identity, immigrants would not have much visibility unless they could be visually Spanish. Even the foreign flamenco artists were proclaimed in government propaganda as much for how Spanish they appeared to be as for their artistic ability. The waning of the dictatorship saw a decline in the economy and in immigration as the government struggled to redefine itself and cede some of its precious centralized bureaucratic powers to provincial and regional institutions. The Comunidad de Madrid was officially formed as an autonomous governing body in 1982, gaining bureaucratic powers in 1983. Immigrants and expatriates slowly began to return to the country in the early years of democracy. So I'm gonna skip ahead a little, I kind of yada yada through the influx in tourism in the post-Franco era, which is after Spain joins the EU in 1986, immigration just quadruples. And especially in Madrid, most of these, the where people come from, instead of coming from other European countries, that tend to come from Latin America, Africa, and Asia. And it just like the numbers reflect that, especially once you get towards the, the turn of the century. So go and see a little bit of uh, what Flamenco looked at like at that time, uh, talking about the incorporation of modern contemporary dance. Uh, many dancers also amped up their dancing to almost superhuman speeds with frenetic footwork and prodigious pirouettes reflected of the fast paced and 24 seven lifestyle of the big city at the end of the century. My emphasis, my emphasis on all this innovation is not meant to portray Madrid Flamenco as a singular entity in opposition to Flamenco from the South. 
By looking at flamenco in Madrid, I hope to problematize the essentialist view of flamenco as only one thing from only one place. Even in the South, there are a myriad of different styles, sometimes even of the same palo in the same city. I intend my Madrid flamenco time map to demonstrate the multiplicity of overlapping, sometimes complementary, sometimes contradictory chains of events and trends that have shaped the cultures always already multiple of the city. The mapping of space shows the pathways taken by migrants, immigrants, immigrants up and down the country, back and forth across the ocean, and even in and out of the city space itself. Flamenco in Madrid, like flamenco everywhere else, is an ever mobile, ever evolving, and evolving, ever growing organic form carried in the bodies of the people who practice and live it. First up, we're going to have um, Gabriela here read a little bio. So bilingual dance educator, artist, and producer dedicated to promoting the development of art, tradition, and culture. Estrada holds a BA and MFA in dance at the University of California, Irvine, and a PhD in flamenco interdisciplinary studies from the University of Seville. Her MFA thesis, the choreographic development of the three-cornered hat through the 20th century, and the case study of her PhD dissertation on the contributions of flamenco to ballet led to producing a documentary, The Legend of uh, Felix. As an educator, Estrada founded Dance Collage affiliated to the Royal Academy of Dance, engaged in teaching dance lecture and technique courses at the University of Sonora and UC Irvine, collaborating as choreographer and teaching artists in theater and dance organizations internationally. Her creative work embraces theatrical Western dance forms, flamenco, and musical theater. Estrada supports Ballet Hispanico's mission as community arts partnership <coughs> education manager, further bridges between Hispanic and Latin American communities and the arts. Thank you so much. All right, bienvenidos, buenos días. It's a pleasure to start with you. It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning with real friends and not close on you. The topic of this presentation came up um, through my experience doing research on the contributions of flamenco to ballet, which was my dissertation topic, pretty much geared from the many close on me I saw in the media within the treatment of flamenco artists we have in discourse and also behind the scenes. Uh, while doing my research in different languages, I was able to observe how different the perceptions, the connotations, the discourse, the meaning, the translations were from one term to the other, and that led me to present this here to you with you. So, raise your hand, I would like to say the translation of embarazada. How would that be the translation of that in Spanish? <laughs> Pregnant, and the translation of uh, is that, for example, for example, carpeta would be not carpet, but archivo, right? Mm -hmm. So all these false um or false cognates are also present in the Spanish dance discourse. As we can see here, for example, ballet, within our context, especially here in New York, we think New York City Ballet, ABT, but within flamenco discourse, ballet can also be a company, not necessarily a dance genre. In terms of Clásico Español y Danza Estilizada, it's uh, even within uh, Spanish culture, it's it's a term that has been evolving and Mariana pretty much defined it as la libre composición de pasos based on escuela bolera, flamenco, or danzas populares. Over here we see this different uh, chart where we can see, for example, the terms ballet as compañía, baile español as Spanish company, baile clásico español style as theatrical dance, escuela bolera, uh, stylized technique that was developed in the early change of the century, of last century, from the Perice um, family, and then Cestilizada, which is what we would see as fusion nowadays. So analyzing these terms also, that's going to take us to look at the different perspectives of the term flamenco. So Alfonso, if we, you say flamenco, you already have a concept very different to somebody down the street, especially here in 42nd or um, 34th Avenue. So from a perspective of EMIC or inside flamenco in Spain, we can see that flamenco is born in the second half of the 19th century, developed in Andalusia. The period of pre-flamenco is pretty much considered the bolero period between 
the 18th century and the mid 19th century. <coughs> La Edad de Oro, also called Café Cantante from the 1860s to 1922, Opera Flamenca, 1922 to 1950s, where we had the big um, development of the flamencología, also called neoclassicism, and the Época de Festivales, or the contemporary period. However, uh, the term flamenco, as we would see defined by the um, Real Academia de la Lengua Española, is very different. Can mean anything from a bird, somebody from Flandes, and one of the many exceptions is also a dance that can be considered something individual or of a collective group that may or may not be associated with Spain, may or not be associated with gypsy culture. But then in flamenco discourse, flamenco has other meanings. For example, among cantaores rancios, if there's somebody singing, you know, una soleada, una seguirilla, somebody comes with una bulería, they're like, hey, momento, que aquí se canta flamenco, right? Or for philologos, flamenco cante might be poetry more than howling for somebody who's foreign to this. For flamenco musicians, flamenco might be an intricate, um, melismatic form of uh, music similar to jazz. And among dancers, we can say flamenco can be something that can be antiguo, that can be a clásico, tradicional, and within clásico it can be more like Antonio Gades that for other people may consider as a gypsy dance. Um, so within the flamenco also we see the stereotypes that are pretty much associated with the gitanos. And within the gitanos, even in Spain, even in Andalusia, and even in the flamenco community, we see many different perceptions of what that means. For some, it's a sign of identity and, uh, <laughs> yes, exactly, um, a sign of solera, and for others, it's a sign of otherness. So the reiteration of these prejudices in flamenco are important to me and are important as a dance educator uh, also because how we present flamenco in our discourse, in our translations, in our literature, in our discourse affects the virtual critiques and reviews, marketing campaigns, programming, and funding and support, but then again perpetrates the myth and the way it affects our artistic community and us here in the room. <coughs> Going into my research <coughs> topic and to finding out the collaborations of flamenco and ballet, which was important for me to realize and to highlight how much ballet is considered a hierarchical form in the arts was benefited from flamenco. I found over 200 collaborations of flamenco artists and ballet companies like the Paris Opera or even Ballet Theater before it became ABT. From these, the first collaborations were uh, in 1917, Compastor Imperi was invited to present herself in her own repertoire in a, in a Función de Beneficio a la Prensa with the Adelips Company, then Felix Fernandez and Maria del Baicín. And then in the Opera Flamenca, we have La Argentinita doing amazing work with Massim for the Ballet Russe and the Ballet Theater. And in the Classicismo, we have Antonio Gades and Mariana leading the charts. And then in the Época de Festivales, Jose Antonio and Jose de Daeta, who also work with Harkness here in New York. So we're going to focus on three case studies. The case studies we're going to focus on and observing how these uh, preconceptions or prejudices of flamenco affected icons in ballet are the ones that the artists pretty much took and embodied in their own identity and made a difference in their lifestyle and also perpetrated them in. And one of them is Fanny Isler, who was from Austria. She was considered the gypsy of the north. She did um, a few um, Spanish-themed repertoire pieces, but her biggest boom was through La Cachucha. And even though she was an amazing dancer with a lot of speed, a lot of uh, interpretation, the way she looked, the way she conveyed her musicality, the pretty much the reason why that boom happened is because of the marketing campaign created by the Opera de Paris, um, in which they pretty much put more like leña al fuego to describe her otherness, to describe her gypsiness, and make all the connections to the associations of the romantic travelers, that pictures uh, that Napoleon stole them, and the paintings that were exhibited in Paris, so it all pretty much played to that. And another um, case is Leonid Massin, but in a very different sense. Leonid Massin didn't have the press to, to back him up. He actually had the ethnographic research life study opportunity to be, to be in Spain for two years, but also with a gifted tutelage of people like Manuel de Falla, Pablo Picasso, Casinada, and Felix Fernandez, an unknown flamenco dancer, 
who actually taught him the song, the dance, the discourse, the language, the savoir faire of flamenco. The thing about Massine is that in collaboration with Felix, they created literary corn after two years of boiling and preparing the stew. And what happened is that it was such a great work that it made a turnaround opportunity for Massine, who five years before had done um, The Legend of Joseph in Paris, taking over Nijinsky, and it was not as acclaimed. But after the three cornered hat, he gained um, great acclaim. And after that, he pretty much cut with Yagalef and started his own career, but pretty much uh, empowered by Spanish dance. As you can see, La Mia Vita en el Baleto, and he's doing his parruca from Three Cornered Hat, or Capricho Español, that he also collaborated again with Argentinita and other flamenco dancers. Uh, he even influenced Jerome Robbins, as we can see in some of his repertoire. And the interesting point about Massin is that he is pretty much one of the biggest threads that brings together continuously ballet and flamenco in companies and in repertoire. And also, in turn, again, it brings it back to Spain. So he pretty much appropriated the, the role of El Lancel Molinero until, gracias a Dios, he shared it with Antonio briefly because it was like, visto no visto, you shared it and then took it back away. But Antonio made a turnaround and presented in a very different way and from there developed a new way of dancing with Mariema, which pretty much developed into the dance estilizada that we see today. However, then again, Massin also collaborated again now with Antonio in the Spanish version of the Amor Brujo, dancing as el espectro. Now the third uh, case study, or the many, but this is very typical, is La Carmen. La Carmen from Marimé, very different from the Carmen and the opera, very different from the stereotypes that we see. And it's just interesting to see that the Carmen from Marimé was brought up of a legend that he heard from the Countess of Montijo. He never saw her. It's not something that was actually happened. It was something that was created. And this myth out of this unknown, intangible figure has created this big boom of La Cigarrera, La Tabacalera. And this pretty much empowered the figure of Roland Petit and his later <laughs> wife, Zizi Janmer, but in a very special way. Roland Petit, again, se baila como se es, was a very fiery artist. He started as a petit rat at the opera, and when he, after he started as sujet with Sergei Lifar dancing El Amor Brujo too, he said, I can do this better. And he just like left the opera and then knocked at Picasso's door and say, I would like to do a piece on your Guernica. Would you like to do my designs? And, and so that's how he started. And he took along his friend, another petit rat from school, René Marcel Janmer at the time. And they were touring with their new company. He saw there was a Carmen Opera in Germany, went to see it. He said he was crying in the theater. He was even bothering the people next to him because he was just so emotional. Went out, went to the embassy, got the libretto went home, did the opera, and a month later did the premiere with Cécile Janmer, um, cutting her hair a la garçon and becoming a sex symbol figure, and both of them launching themselves into international fame. However, not all these um, appropriation images are positive. This is a, the case Félix El Loco, that is known as Félix El Loco, and not as a flamenco artist, one of the best ambassadors and responsible of the many influence of flamenco in the international scene. He is called Felix El Loco, therefore is Loco, therefore any contributions he have are diminished. Felix El Loco collaborated with Massin, Faya Picasso, worked with Yagalef as consulting, was a teaching artist for the Ballet Rouge, pretty much was tutor of Massin, and right before the premiere he disappeared and was lost, supposedly was found dancing furiously in a church, was put in a mental asylum for life, declared dead while alive, and so on and so forth. So the issue that I want to bring about is that none of this has been proven. And just because he was a gypsy or a loco, everybody repeats from a few stances like this of information, the, the literature repeats and repeats and justifies him as a loco. There's no photo of him, and they associate his photo as to any loco. The hair just, they associate as gypsy, therefore he was illiterate. He didn't know what he was signing with Diana. When his signature is beautiful, his concept, his philosophical concepts of flamenco are amazing. And he even developed his own system of notation, which he taught to Massim. 
So, el loco? I don't think so. So, that closes pretty much the contrasting uh, perceptions of the value of artists in um, flamenco discourse, but it brings us also to a question for us. My conclusion is our reflection. What are our own biases? How are we perpetrating those biases as teachers, as choreographers, as artists, as educators, as critics, <coughs> as scholars? It's our responsibility to make a difference. It's our responsibility to appeal not only for the art itself, but also for respect in humanity and for our own growth of our art form. Thank you very much. We're on time now, so. Okay. <laughs> All right, so our next presenter is uh, Julie Wagenstas. And. Julie is uh, part of the dance faculty of Emory University, where she teaches flamenco improvisation, choreography, and technique, as she learned from her teachers in Spain and the USA. She has an MA in Spanish with a focus on flamenco and Spanish linguistics, literature, fine arts, and cultural studies. She con contributed to the exhibition 100 Years of Flamenco in New York, as well as the forthcoming anthology Spaniards, Natives, Africans, and Roma, Transatlantic Malagueñas and Zapateados in Music, Song, and Dance. She lectures on African, Latin American, and gypsy influences in flamenco as a full-time teaching artist. Julie produces flamenco performances and educational seminars nationwide involving Spanish flamenco artists in residence in the United States of America via her company, Verdole, as well as the nonprofit Atraves, which focuses on projects that connect Spanish artists with and students mm -hmm. of Georgia schools. Thank you. Um, thank you guys for coming to the presentation. Um, I'm going to read this little bit of a poem from T.S. Eliot to the end, and I'm going to encourage you not to look at the words. You can close your eyes, gaze off to the ceiling um, while I read. I think it's, it's one of those things that needs to be heard. <clears throat> time present and time past are both perhaps present in time future, and time future contained in time past. If all time is eternally present, all time is unredeemable. What might have been is an abstraction, remaining a perpetual possibility only in a world of speculation. What might have been and what has been point to one end which is always present. Footfalls echo in the memory down the passage which we did not take toward the door we, did, we, we never opened into the rose garden. My words echo thus in your mind. Now imagine if this bit of this poem, which is the first of four quartets, imagine if this was printed on the back of cereal boxes that kids looked at while they ate their Wheaties or their Cocoa Puffs in the morning. And then imagine if this idea were also printed on the backs of those cereal boxes. This is the theory of imaginary geographies by Edward Said. And Said wrote uh, theories about Orientalism in the late 20th century when he was trying to deal with how the US was treating the Middle East in media. And his idea of an imaginary geography is that this is the story that we tell ourselves and that we project to other people about who we are based on where we're from, where we, are, where we have been, and where we imagine we will go in time and space. Now imagine if kids could read this and then go off to school and go off to see the world to solve their math problems, to read their literature, to deal with other people old and young for the rest of their lives. Both of these ideas play an important role in our cultural identity. And I believe that flamenco is an ideal artistic practice to teach a child how to deal with this and how to understand himself in relation to those around him. And here I mention the history of others. I don't mean to say the other, but I do mean to say others because as a child learns about different perspectives of history, 
the child may look at the person next to him with whom he identifies as a peer and realize there is difference as they both perceive difference. So, specifically, I'm talking about Generation Z, because I live with two of these kids. Generation Z was born with uh, devices in their hands, and I guarantee you they are using those devices now to communicate with other people, kids and adults, all around the world. Generation Z was born in a time when we are post-civil rights, second wave post-civil rights, post-feminism, post-modernism, post, 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 and they're quite different from their Generation X parents, their potentially millennial parents, <laughs> um, their gener potentially Generation X grandparents, and definitely their baby boomer grandparents. And the difference comes in there because of our globalization that we're dealing with, and that globalization is changing those imaginary geographies that we all hold as individuals. And so how the kids may deal with their peers as they grow and how they may deal with later generations is going to be quite different, that, that generation gap, so to speak. It's going to be quite different simply based on the many changes that have taken place due to globalization. Not just globalization, increased globalization, and I will argue hyper-globalization for these kids. Maybe not for us, but for these kids, and it goes back to how globalization changes communication. Okay, so, based on this, mm -hmm. I take this idea, when I go to schools, I'm a practicing flamenco artist, and I'm a full-time teaching artist, so I talk to kids a lot, and uh, when I talk to kids, I, I want to talk to them about how to use the arts to do different things that they need to do in their lives, right? And a really good way to start talking to them is about meatballs, because everybody knows what a meatball is. <laughs> and when I ask kids to raise their hands and be brave and yell out an ingredient of meatballs, every kid can name at least one ingredient, right? It, it kind of levels the playing ground and makes it safe for us. Now, then, then I talk about a little bit about how we take the ingredients of these meatballs, which are uh, able to stand alone by themselves. The onion does not need the basil, and the breadcrumbs in its plurality is just fine, standing alone next to the egg, encapsulated in its hard shell, protected. But we're going to chop those things up. We're going to let the oils ooze out of the basil and mix with the oil of the garlic, and we're going to put it together with a raw egg until it becomes something completely these might be my ingredients for flamenco. If you can imagine uh, taking a, it's called a core. This is what scientists use when they drill down into like an iceberg to go down and get a sample of time, frozen way back in history, physically frozen in the ice. They'll take that core out and then they'll study what they find in that core. Imagine if you could go back in time, these would be most of the influences that you would find in flamenco. I don't know how many teaspoons or tablespoons of, or cups you need to put into your recipe. I think that depends on the palo because a sambra would be much different than a solia, which might be much different than a wajira or not. But when I talk about taking these ingredients and mixing them to make flamenco, I'm not just talking about ingredients. I'm talking about, ooh, let's go back there, cultural expression and little bits of cultural expression from each of these places, okay? Now, what is cultural expression? The hands don't go up so quickly when I ask kids about that in the, in the schools. It's how we communicate our culture, right? And so I give the kids some examples. I find a kid who's wearing the t-shirt with a mascot and I say, that is a form of cultural expression because when you leave the school and you go down to the grocery store, somebody's gonna see that and know where you go to school and know that you want to express that you go to that school. Then the hands start going up and kids start naming things like, oh, flag is a form of cultural expression, language, accent, and inevitably somebody says, race. And I go, okay, what is race? And some kid might say, oh, well, you know, like the color of your skin and how your hair is. Oh, okay, physical characteristics. Anybody else have another idea about race? Another kid might throw his hand in the air and say, well, it's where you're from. Okay, well, what's another way to talk about race? And then somebody might say, they might say, it's what you believe in. Yeah? Now, it's debatable 
it is documented that it's debatable as to what race it is, and the kids know that it's debatable. So this is why we should take flamenco into the schools and take it apart and talk about it, not necessarily in terms of race in third grade, but talk about it for its pieces so that the kids can become equipped to look at it not as a binary, not as a singular, but in its plurality. Now, cultural expression, um, I'm gonna argue that it's changeable. I, at first I broke these things up, um, broke these categories up into ideology and identity and then genetic characteristics, thinking, oh, genetic characteristics, you can't change those. Yes, just about everything you can change. Nation of birth, you know in your heart where you were born, but you can always change your citizenship. So it's changeable. And so then, is race a cultural expression? Is race changeable? Is it transferable? Well, when I go into the schools, a lot of the time my flamenco presentations are presented under the umbrella of cultural arts. And cultural arts are used in the schools. I'm from Georgia, by the way. I'm talking about the state of Georgia. I work in South Carolina, North Carolina, Alabama, and Louisiana. So I represent the South. All right, so cultural arts around there are used as a way to see the world. So we're looking then at local versus foreign. What's different between us and them, right? It's a binary, us and them. Maybe they're even looking for what's similar, us and them. So when kids hear music played by people that look like this, they're taught to identify that these people are from India and they play Indian music. When they see a lady like this, oh, she's Chinese and that's a Chinese ribbon dance. And when they see this, they're taught to think that those kids in that picture are from Namibia. They're Swana people in the country of Namibia. So, is this enough to talk about each one of those people to identify them with a race or people or country? We could leave flamenco in its piece. I'm going to back it up there. We could leave flamenco. In its, in its piece as it is presented as a Spanish art form. We could go in there and talk about our polka dots and our nails and our shoes and how we're from Andalusia. Or could we, because a lot of the people who are presenting flamenco in schools in America are not Spanish, right? All right, so then if we're gonna talk about race, if we're gonna talk about people and stereotypes, what are we talking about in flamenco? Whether you're an American flamenco artist or a Spanish flamenco artist or a flamenco artist from someplace else binary in there, white and black, European and gypsy, right? Because that's what's written in the books that a lot of the educators are reading. I'd like to start telling the educators and the kids to think about it as a circle or in, in a circular fashion and think about the different cultural expressions that contributed to flamenco that are there in that meatball. These aren't all of them on my slide, but these are a few of them that, that come to mind quickly. And these are the ones that I like to talk about when I go into the schools and I tell kids about flamenco. Now, if we think about flamenco as a meatball, then we're talking about transculturation. And this is the idea about bringing together two or more cultural, or cultural expressions, I'll say, and looking at and focusing on the parts of those expressions that can be combined and those parts that can't be combined, uh, just put those to the side and don't worry about it. And this is a big deal in Latin America, especially. Um, it's a big deal around the world. But in Latin America, because we had the coming together of Europeans, of indigenous people, and then of enslaved Africans. And there was, there was a, a battle for status, uh, class-wise. Um, there was a battle for, um, for freedom, for permission, for territory and there was great mixing of cultures. So if you think about flamenco as transculturation, the, the, the result of transculturation, then you're looking at something that's fused together happily. Talking about dresses, nails on shoes, castanets, the guitar in the background, you can talk about that as a whole. That's fine. There's no harm in that because that is flamenco as it is sold in the schools, the shape of flamenco. The educators where I'm from say flamenco dancers um, or flamenco artists express passion and flamenco dancers stomp their feet very quickly and loud. We could leave it at that. It's true, right? Mm -hmm. It's what's written in the books. But then 
If we take the moment to think about those kids who are going to grow up in a hyper-globalized situation, they may need to be able to deal with more than just a shape, a single shape. They may be able to need to deal with the world in its plurality. And that's what we're doing this in this conference. We're starting to look at the different forces that are in flamenco, besides those which we've read about previously. And now, in order to take these different forces together, I want to move from trans-excuse me, transcultural to hybridization. And I want to uh, I want to emphasize that hybridization is a process. It's not a product. It's the process of one culture entering another in the scope of hegemony. So one culture is going to be in power and the other culture is not going to be in power. And this is the case across Latin America where you have cultures entering and, and assuming power over another culture. And when you look at flamenco and you look at the different cultural influences from this side of the Atlantic, you see the tango of Argentina, the rumba of Cuba, you see uh, influences where the process of hybridization has created, excuse me, you see instances where the process of hybridization have created art forms that then have had pieces of their cultural expression pulled into flamenco to create the art form that we have today. So, there we have this idea of a power structure within flamenco, not just in flamenco in Andalusia, where you may have the Spaniard and the Gypsy as part of a marginalized class, but you have the insides of flamenco that is, in addition, are part of the process or the results of the process of hybridization. Okay, so transculturation, hybridization, imaginary geography, these are big words for kids, right? How do we communicate this to kids? Mm. He's a teaching artist. What is that? That's a blobfish, and it's not quite as complicated as a teaching artist, all right? A teaching artist is somebody who can take their art form and break it down into some conceptual components and then filter curriculum ideas through those components so that you get the kids to a point where they are making art based on the discipline while learning about and expressing something that has to do with their school curriculum. A teaching artist is not someone who gets on stage when you take your kids on the school bus to see a show at a theater. A teaching artist is not a musician or a teacher who teaches kids music, no matter how famous and accomplished the musician is. This is a teaching artist. This is a colleague of mine. His name is Barry Stewart Mann. He has a degree from Harvard, and he spends his days with kids with handmade maps of the world and guitars and songs that deal with science, math, and humanities. And when the kids make art, they are expressing not only an art form, but something in their curriculum that's related to the art form. And all this is possible. We're in a great time as teaching artists because we have Common Core. Um, I'm gonna go really quickly through this part. <laughs> Common Core was established in 2010 as the uh, reaction to the failure of No Kid Left Behind. Mm -hmm. There are standards and frameworks that help guide educators nationwide um, so that kids um, are supposed to be ready for college by the time they get there because what ha was happening with No Child Left Behind, the kids, they found they may pass, but they weren't, they, they may pass their subject matter, but they weren't truly prepared when they got to college. So it's a federal initiative, Common Core, but it's adopted by the states. The states in green have adopted it, the states in yellow have not, and in a lot of the states that have not, they've created their own Common Core. Uh, so that they're, they're pretty much in line uh, with the rest of the country. And so, so this is the idea, no matter where a kid is, the kid is gonna be given the same opportunity to gain the same skills. Now, how those skills are delivered to the kids, are that's up to individual teachers. It comes down to administration, and then the teachers have to implement it across their teaching teams. Um, states adopt it, like I said, this is our website in Georgia where you can go read the standards. Go Google your state standards, you can find them. And this is an example of a standard. Craft instructor, it says, this is for um, literacy, which would have been language arts when we were kids. And it's for fifth grade, and it's about 
reading um, text, not like an encyclopedic um, entry, so not an informational text, but it could be a poem, a narrative, or a story. It says, determine the meaning of words and phrases as, as they are used in a text, including figurative language, such as metaphors and similes. Okay, so what would happen here is the teacher would give the definition of what is a metaphor and what is a simile, the kids would understand it, and then they'd be given different texts, the kids would identify those things, and they'd have a discussion. As a flamenco teaching artist, I look at this, and I think, I can go in there, I can teach the kids to sing Triana, Triana, que bonita esta Triana. If they need it in English, I'll translate it. But in that song lyric, they're going to sing it, they're going to dance it, we're going to talk about the rhythm, and then we're going to find the metaphors, and if there are similes in there as well. And I've turned a flamenco song lyric into a literacy study for, uh, what would this be, fifth grade. So I'm going to go really quickly through some other standards. Dance. There are standards for dance. The kids can get graded there. Dance communicates meaning. Um, dance, here do, the, the students need to describe and reflect upon their own dance as well as another. See yourself, understand yourself by understanding someone else, the other, others. Um, explore the role of dance in various cultures. Why do we stand in flamenco? Why, why do we stand in a circle in flamenco? Explain that. Uh, patterns of behavior and interaction among cultures. Look at our, our many cultures that are part of our hybridization in flamenco. And then you can get outside of just Spain and you can begin to deliver to the kids the, the plurality of flamenco and give them the skills to think in terms of a problem having more than one solution but many perspectives for solving. Um, let's see, I'm gonna skip through this one here. And now we get into social studies. Um, <coughs> describe the results of blending of ethnic groups in Latin America and the Caribbean. I love to play an old recording that I have of Punta Cubano and uh, break down the clave and then take it into the 12 count and cambiola that we have in working back and then teach the kids to dance a little bit about that and explain to them how the shifts went back and forth. Um, let's see, we go through some more social studies things here. There are so many ways to just de define the Colombian exchange and its global economic and cultural impact. You can tell the story of sugar through flamenco. You can tell the story of tobacco through the menton de manila. So as I do this, as I go around and I talk about, I, I present flamenco this way to kids, um, some observations that I've made are that um, there's a lack of awareness of geography. Um, when I ask kids where is flamenco from, when I start to talk to them about anything dealing with the Spanish language, Mexico comes out. And um, then when I, I ask them for some different answers, some different perspectives, they lack the, the sense of Europe in terms of there being Spanish language in Europe. Um, a finely tuned ear or eye. Sometimes I find this and sometimes I don't find this. Um, and usually I find that the kids, it's very easy for the kids to step into having a finely tuned ear or eye. Sometimes the teachers, I find the teachers are educated on this idea of the fact that these transatlantic crossings also carry the arts and that something like flamenco could be as rich as it is in world history and art history. Um, and um, sometimes I find um, I, find, I find a mix there, that some kids, some teachers are educated and some teachers are not. But I, I really remember one child, a teenager at the DeKalb School of the Arts, which is a high school uh, performing arts magnet school. Um, I was giving a, a, a workshop, I had the kids in a circle, and I was explaining the, the African connection. And this kid, this is like the worst performing, one of the worst performing school districts in our state, and the most scandal ridden in our state. And, um, and this, this student goes, everything started in Africa. As if her teacher, every teacher had told her something about this that whole week, and she was just hearing it one more time from me. So it's interesting to see the, the mixture of response. Okay, so I'm gonna conclude here to say, you know, flamenco is this great way to get a kid to uh, understand himself by learning these different perspectives of history, right? But this, this doesn't stop there at how do we create a person who is very uh, capable of, of existing and succeeding in a hyper-globalized world. This parallels the kind of problem solving of creativity. And if you want great problem solvers in the world, then you want to teach the kids how to become creative thinkers. 
so that they can see things outside of binary options and begin to, to seek out and realize the many perspectives from which problems can be solved, whether it be a problem of race or anything else that might come up in the future. Thank you. We're right on time now, so we have a nice chunk of change for some Q and A. I know anybody just open the floor up for questions. Yes. I'm sorry, um, Julie. I couldn't hear what that student said. Oh, I didn't hear the quote. Oh, sorry. Uh, she she said with this this great time, everything started in Africa. Nobody has anything. I'm going to say a few things that I noticed. Like, I love that we all have this idea, whether we articulate or not, of geography and circulation. Hmm. Like mine, I, I refer to it as a micro-local study, because when you look at my dissertation, it's really about a few blocks in Madrid. And it goes into this deep, like, mapping of stuff. And you guys kind of spread it out a little bit more. But it's both, both I think, it's all, like, connected, you know? So I do like that. Um, a couple of things I'm going to say from from yours uh, is I do write a lot about like you know ballet espanol and I have to go into a whole like okay let me when I'm talking to dance people okay when they say ballet in these documents you have to look at they're referring to all the they're usually in Franco's time it's ballet francés mm -hmm. is classical ballet mm -hmm. and then yeah so that's one thing and then um, also uh, I actually talked briefly with the Gluck program in. Uh, the UC system, um, I had some problems with it because, okay, so I taught there, I'm a dancer and I'm female. Before me, Josh Brown, guitarist, male, taught there. With me, they wanted me to dress up and do all this stuff. They never asked. I, I called them, I was like, did they ever ask you to wear a costume? He was like, uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> so that was like, automatically, that's one thing, like, I, I, I refuse to, like, I, I have a month on that I might bring out that I love so much, but I don't, I'm not going to, you know, get all dressed up and run it. I'm sorry. Like, that's just not me. But uh, I do feel like there's different, uh, in terms of teaching flamenco, there's different mm -hmm. standards for in terms of gender. But yeah. anyway, so I'm yeah. gonna, yeah. I have noticed that um, very much as I've gone around and I've watched other people's school shows mm -hmm. and um, the, the difference, the response by the audience to the performance or, or to the presentation when a man is leading it is quite different than the response when a woman is leading it. And um, and for that reason, I have over the over time looked for men, usually those are the guitarists, to, to take a bigger role in what we're doing so that it's, it's not, I don't know if it's because their teachers are female or it's, I, Maybe that's another people. I think it's right. the burden, I, I, maybe like the burden of representation in flamenco tends to be like, even in performing, like uh, looking, I've been looking at book gigs in LA and it's like, uh, I don't want to name names, but there's male dancers that perform in just basically like t-shirt and blue jeans. And mm -hmm. then the woman comes out, full on, yes. mata, everything. You can't just like, I was like, why can't I perform in t-shirt and jeans? Uh -huh. Come on. Sure, do it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Totally. Yeah, I think pretty much this relates also to the how deep grounded all these biases are. Mm -hmm. For and one of the things I wanted to share too um, from my research was that no matter what, no matter how much time passes, we still face the same thing. For example, Antonio and Rosario, there are, there are instances in the press that they say and state and affirm that they were born in a cave from fortune tellers and they were cousins. Yeah. Cuando nacieron en Sevilla y nada or when they were interviewed and they were asked uh, for the first seasons here in, in New York, they served them food on the floor. They could please sit down on the floor to eat so they could film them more like in situ. And things like that. So the discrepancy of what we're talking about the minutes and not only how do you deal with those situations as an artist, as an, as an entity, you know, just do you say no to the New York Times and say bye, or do you say okay, and then later on, you know, turn around the situation when he pretty much presented himself as one of the most cultural and icon developers of Spanish dancing culture, you know, within ballet, within flamenco, within just, you know, literacy and all the recognition to gain. 
through the years. So I think that's really important. And it's pretty much not, I mean, at first when I started my research, I used to think it was pretty much a, a marketing campaign or it's pretty much because we were, you know, from this other side of the Atlantic that we would see more of these kind of references. But even in Spain, Alfonso, tú sabes, you know, there's so much prejudice about Kitanos. Your name is Fernandez, you have a hard time finding a job. You know, so it's it's so embedded in so many, I would say, areas of opportunity for human condition through history that... The thing, the thing is, nowadays, um, I think the, the Kitanos who are flamenco performers are completely integrated in flamenco society. I mean, in, in Spanish society, sorry because they fulfill a function mm. within the, the well, the culture is about in Spain. Mm. And you are absolutely right, uh, it is still discrimination, but it depends on the places, uh, I guess, uh, where they go, where I, I, I mean, I personally uh, grew up there and I know of those prejudices. Um, and it's, yeah, it is, it is about what they do. Uh, if they are flamencos, they are completely integrated. If they are not flamencos, they is prejudice. Okay. And let's also learn, like, when part of my analysis, too, was compared to see what was, you know, the different characteristics that were, like, exploited in stage. And I asked Isabel Bayon one day, I was like, I don't see that difference in terms that I would be able to document Ivo Gitano you know, this is, these are these characteristics. She's like, really? Is it a look deeper? And so there are also characteristics that you learn to associate, mm -hmm. right? Because otherwise you would see an artist from an artist, not necessarily, a, you know, an entity. Yeah, I think, well, I think there's also a lot of mixing. I mean, you can know like, who is a Gitano burro, who is a pure Gitano. I mean, if you look at my mother, she's very dark, she has a very dark complexion. She could pass as a Gitano. She was born in Piliana. But I, my father was very fair complexion and my genetics made me a little bit fair. But uh, I think, I think it's, it's all about what they, what they do. In Jerez, for instance, people mm -hmm. are mixed very much. I mean, there are a lot of families who have mixed. So it's, I think it's, it's all about identity, about culture, about mm -hmm. race, about, I mean, so many. So many layers. Layers. Mm -hmm. um, I studied flamenco in Spain for about 15 summers and I saw all the best dancers, heard the best singers, the best guitarists. One of the things that bothers me about flamenco is that the non-gypsy performers have all the PR, they have, I mean, and I tell people, Paco de Lucia, was not really the best flamenco guitarist in my estimation, but he had the best PR and he wasn't the gypsy. Then I hear on the other side when I'm in Spain, they say, well, the gypsies don't trust any of the agents. That's why they don't come to America as much. It's like really interesting. Well, I, uh, first off, as you know, just to kind of like, because she's not here, my colleague uh, Gretchen, and I just want to problematize the use of the, the G word. When I teach, I don't use the G word. Mm -hmm. I use Spanish Roma now, I'll say Gitano, because mm -hmm. when I teach the letras, you hear it all the time, but I just want to bring up that that's kind of a problem word, just heads up. But in general, I, I think that's the, a lot of times that's a, a, something that people put on that group of people that this kind of idea of distrust, which, hey, you know, there are persecuted people for hundreds and hundreds of years. Of course, you're not going to trust authority, but who does? But uh, yeah, so I'm just going to, you know. No, thank you for that. But. And I appreciate you mentioning that because, I mean, for example, among the flamenco community, especially in Spain, it's not, mm -hmm. it's not a word that you need to be. Yeah. You know. It's changing. It's changing now. I had a long discussion with a, a friend of mine who's a musician whose wife is part of the Asociación uh, de Gitanas Feministas, and they're really like working on getting this idea out in like Spanish culture. You know, they use the word Roma, Romani, Roma Español instead of, yeah. yeah. But what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, it's part of like, you know, the Generation C or Latinx. Like, I don't consider myself Latinx, but for other people, I would be certainly Latinx and it would be the appropriate term. So I was just trying to say that um, 
my intentions are very friendly and using the word pretty much into what my contacts are with all respect. And I do appreciate you bringing up that point. Uh, you had a question, Brian, or a comment? I wonder, I'm sorry, I missed a part of the beginning, but when you brought up geography and place, it, I found it interesting to consider. I wonder as a teaching artist, maybe how this comes in in terms of addressing issues of like power and privilege, then who gets access to certain mm. things? So, I mean, you bring up the good point of, of the touring. Then in what ways are we perhaps addressing that if you are a contemporary white flamenco or flamenca dancer or artist that you're getting booked at the Festival Flamenco mm -hmm. in every city? Right. And then if you're a gitana or gitana, you're A, maybe not getting those bookings, or when you go there, then you're ripped apart by the New York Times because you just yeah. stood on stage and you didn't do anything interesting, <laughs> even though it's one of the most revered dancers in the entire community. Mm -hmm. So if you address sort of those power privileges, but then also speaking of access to space, in terms of reviews, I think Randy have a great point because, like I say, it's a big responsibility on the review, and a lot of the reviews are written by a pen that's directed by otherness. Mm -hmm. So, you know, intricate zapateo like Carmen Amaya, that when you see it in Partitura, you're like, oh my God. And then people, some somebody might write a review saying that she was just stomping the floor <laughs> like a metrayette, blah, 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 you know, this fiery. And what are we going to do? Can we talk about the musicality? <laughs> Can we talk about the creative art? Can we talk about the intricacy of the of her development as a creative artist, you know, in the moment? So that has a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. In terms of the festivales, I think this is also part of any question, like, you know, why the Bee Gees were more famous than other artists and so on. Mm -hmm. the, the pretty much, it's in, in all the art forms, I would say, not to justify, but in all the art forms and in life, like the government we have today, is not only the merit, but it's also the luck or the strategy, so who you know? <laughs> well, but also there's a certain, so I caused a little bit of a, a stir at a dance studies conference where I just threw one, I like to throw random lines in just to like make people mad. <laughs> so I threw in this one line because I was talking about, you know, the, the Nacional Flamenquismo and how that, you know, using flamenco and the certain styles that were promoted to promote the a certain idea of Spain at the time. And I said, well, but that's not all that different now from booking like Israel Galvan, Rocio Molina. That represents a certain ideology that you're trying to represent to the world. And oh my God, you had thought I'd like insulted the Pope or something. Like it was like, how dare you say that, that Israel Galvan and Rocio Molina are embodying an ideology of Spain. I was like, well, I mean, sorry, modernism isn't like, if you think about it, like but promoting the, the, the idea of like the modern Spain, it's, you know, so I don't know. I mean, I think it's, it's, really complicated there, but... <laughs> I've always wondered who is making uh, the decisions in these festivals and how does one uh, gain access to, uh, to, to apply to a festival? I know, I know how it works here in the, in the States and I know what, what steps have to be taken. It's to starting to be it. like that in, in Spain. So it used to be certain artists would always get funding from the, that they knew them, they didn't have to do anything. They're like, all right, we know this family, we're gonna give you money. Now they have to come up with a business plan mm -hmm. and like a prospectus and stuff. And so if you have the, the education, the access to mm -hmm. that, to do that or have people around you that know how to do that, you can get that. Mm -hmm. If you don't. Yeah. And there's also a ways to appeal and so on, that's complicated. The thing is, um, I mean, regarding what you, what you pointed out, I think today in Spain uh, there is the uh, Centro Madrid de Promoción del Flamenco, mm -hmm. sí. and sí. they 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 give funding mm -hmm. every two years to I mean roughly every two years to produce shows in the Bienal de Flamenco, yeah, I know, I know. and a lot of the shows that we get here in New York, uh, mm -hmm. and yeah. in the United States, uh, during the flamenco festivals that are organized here are productions that were done in the Biennale. Mm -hmm. The thing is, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a consequence of, of cultural, political right. policy. It's, mm -hmm. you know, yes. it's yes. politics. Yeah, it and, is. Uh, and the thing also, because of uh, all the artists have to present something new every two years, the quality of what uh, I read in, in a fantastic book by uh, Gamboa, uh, a history, it's titled No Historia del Flamenco, a history of mm -hmm. Flamenco. That uh, Antonio Gades mm -hmm. spent five years mm -hmm. developing the one show. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, 
how much quality is there going to be and how deep is that or, or how good that show is going to be quality. when they have to come out with a show every two years. Yeah, yeah. And then they have to tour it. Mm -hmm. And then they, they have to start another show again. Yeah, right. So, um, I mean, it's uh, creativity against tradition, uh, money against no money, marketing, no marketing. Mm -hmm. There are so many layers, and um, I don't agree about part of the music. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was the best. Well, no, okay. I think you're entitled to Gracias, Alfonso. No, I think uh, in gustos are rampant generos, and everybody has their own taste and style, priorities, and aesthetics, so, so respect that. But I agree with you, Paco Lucia. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but um, in terms of time and evolution, like you were saying about the globalization, interconnectedness of media, the new generations are more used to the whole package. Dancing, marketing, media, socializing, mm -hmm. the website, gay, Instagram, like this. Mm -hmm. And other generations may need a helping hand or may need to devote more time or to even learn about it before doing it. So there's also a comparative disadvantage of the immediateness or the resources that make the key turnaround for these cases. I have one last comment. Um, I noticed because of going to Spain so many times and going to the little, little pueblos, you know, you have this flamenco book of all the festivals in every little pueblo, mm -hmm. and I used to go to all of those. Mm -hmm. Here in the States, when we say flamenco, we mean people think of dance. Mm -hmm. But in Spain, mm -hmm. when you say flamenco, they think of singing. And unless they say baile flamenco or whatever, mm -hmm. you cannot presume that there's going to be a dancer. Yeah. And I'm wondering why all the symposia here have been just flamenco as opposed to flamenco dance because that's it, it's usually talking about dances and steps and you know the, structures. That's implying that you, you there's a, a definite you know break between each of the forms. I mean, I would argue that that you can you can't say flamenco dance without also implying music. You can't say music. There's there's like there's embodiment in in the music. There's you know there's a back and forth. It's not just like and I think this artificial separation. Well, I think that's one of the problems with focusing just on this going back to the geography, the space of the stage as opposed to the space of like just socializing. I mean, that's most of my dissertation. It's, I don't really talk about anything that's going on on stage. I talk about like hanging out after shows, going to like the, the Cueva underneath Candela, you know, there's a lot of that. There's not a lot of like, oh, we did this step or that step, you know, unless I'm talking about Amor de Dios, that's, that's it. Like, so I think that ignores like the lived reality of flamenco as opposed to just the, like this artificial separation well, maybe, maybe it's just the symposia I've been to, but mm -hmm. yesterday, you know, we went to see Murube, they talk about contra danza, minuet, blah, blah, and these are all dance steps. They're yeah. not rhythms. They're not in the singing. They're mm -hmm. in the dance. That's all I'm saying. I, yeah, I, I feel like a lot of the um, research has yet to be done to make the connections in dance in terms of the, the ideas that we're discussing in uh, symposiums such as this one, uh, and you know, of the, of the research that has been done, it's still being connected into flamenco and, and mm -hmm. flamenco back to it. Mm -hmm. So we don't see all of those fruits just yet. Whereas with the music and singing, and in particular rhythm, a lot has been written about that already mm -hmm. um, for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And so there, there are some resources for us to lean on on that to, to start to have conversations which are starting to happen. Mm -hmm. um, I think as the dance, um, the research in the dance comes out, you'll see more focus on the dance. I don't think we know how to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. In terms of flamenco <laughs> yet. Uh, it's, not, it's not so documented. In, right. And, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But it also has to do with the resources available to universities. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. at this point, at this moment, and excuse my ignorance, I perceive there are probably more dance related yeah. venues at universities to Absolutely. do research uh, in dance and therefore it coincides with more yeah. dance majors or whatever are here but then again it's, you know like we're saying in Spain and the, it's more level because also the the ratio of availability I would think I mean, I would say as somebody that's in the university system in the United States and dance studies, there's not a lot for flamenco. There's not really like for other dance forms. If you want to talk about, you know, somebody that does flamenco and contemporary, you know, it's yeah. like if you just want to talk about like flamenco hanging out, 
It's, there's not, like, I get pushed to, like, oh, look at the stage more. What are the and choreographic analysis, which I'm like, <laughs> there's other people that are doing that. <laughs> I don't know. Julie, I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about ways that you get your students to talk about identity through the lens of flamenco with, like, maybe an, uh, an exercise or something like that. Okay, so there, there are a few of them. Um, there, let's see, let's talk about um, one that involves movement, okay? So there are some very basic uh, dance steps that you can teach to students, then you know, pick them up really quickly. Um, and then, you know, you can just simply change the music um, from something that's hongo to something that's chico or vice versa, and ask them to express themselves, um, ex express the, the idea of whatever the, this polo is, right? And so um, this helps them to express emotionally, and they might start to notice some differences about how their peers are expressing themselves emotionally, or some similarities, right? Um, and in terms of um, song lyrics, when you go, th there's, there's this thing that's really important right now called uh, making inferences. And um, it, is, it is a skill that will go way beyond literacy. Uh, but it's a literacy skill that, that kids are working on so that when they read a text, be it informational or, or not, that they then consider everything that they know in the world, mm -hmm. everything that they've just read in the text, and then they come up with some kind of an idea. Uh, not necessarily a conclusion, but, but maybe a conclusion, right? Um, and so in that, the kids are leaning on their cultural background. Uh, to to come up with their their new thought about this. So, one exercise that I use is I, I take the song lyric um, El otro día te vi llevabas limones verdes y una matita de perejil. Uh, I saw you I saw you the other day carrying uh, uh, green lemons and a bunch of parsley. And so we analyze that. Uh, kids, can you tell me why is somebody walking down the street with uh, parsley and lemons? What are they going to do? They're going to cook something. Or they going to cook salsa. Salsa's from Mexico. We're talking about Spain. What do they cook with green lemons and parsley in Spain? I don't know. And so there's an idea of cultural expression coming out, and it's a learning opportunity for kids. So they start to understand their world is not the same as this other world, right? And then, um, and then from there, you know, we do a little more analysis about setting and character and um, narrator, um, since it's poetry. Um, we can talk about some figurative things in there as well. And then I ask the kids to write a story. What happened before or after that moment? And, um, and I ask them, think about their own lives um, and think about everything that they know about Spain already. Uh, to go write that story. And then you'll see different stories come out uh, based on, on their expression. Um, and then besides that, um, when, I, when I have a moment, um, I, and I encourage people, get out of the assembly program mode and get into an in-classroom workshop mode. You'll spend about the same amount of time in the school, if you consider load in, two shows back to back and load out, then you'll spend about the same amount of time, you'll make about the same amount of money, and, but you'll have a chance to look a kid in the eye and actually have a conversation with a kid. And then in, in the sense of tell me about cultural expression, then you can slow down and have a conversation for five or 10 minutes. Um, and even ask the kids to break into small groups and discuss, cult discuss cultural expression in their own uh, communities, in their school, the community, family, and they can come up with some compare and contrast kinds of things. Time for one more question. I know you have uh, Just going back to uh, referencing a couple of things that you said about costume and dance and why the dance and why the costume. I was drawn to flamenco because of the costume. And there's a lot of us Americans who are very visual. I grew up near Hollywood. And the dance is a very accessible, as I would call it, gateway drug to flamenco. And the costume is a gateway drug to the dance because we see it and we're like, oh, ruffles, colors, fringes, this is fabulous, you know? And, and I was reading Neil Gaiman the other night and he was talking about reading and how reading is like, even if it's like kind of a bad book, it's a gateway drug to learning how much is accessible to you as an individual. You don't need anybody's permission to go to the library and use the library. I feel that the costumes and the visual, even though it's just a silhouette on the board, is a gateway drug to what is flamenco. And then, okay, so the majority of the people in America don't know Cante Hondo, but they know Bamboleo. 
And if they start liking what I consider the potato chip of the <laughs> they will someday eat the steak. So I don't think that wearing a costume is a bad thing. Yes, I would like it if I didn't have to carry so many ruffles around. They're heavy and they wrinkle. But you know, on the other hand, it's something that catches somebody that might not otherwise look. I find it interesting how many times when, when a, a school will book me and they'll say, you're going to wear a costume, right? <laughs> well, I'm coming to represent flamenco. I, yes, I will wear a costume. There are times when I think about it. No, I'm not. I'm going to wear what I wear to dance yeah. class because I, this is a workshop moment. Mm -hmm. And it, I, it's not a theater stage. It's not a theater production. And, you know, the, the kids need to go to the theater to see a theater production. This is, this is an interactive learning and teaching moment. I'll wear the costume. I mean, <laughs> I have to, I've, you know, I've also part of it. Bad thing. There's, yeah. there's two sides to every yeah. point, you know, yeah. and, and we do need to bring people to what is the essence of flamenco. It's not just polka dots and ruffles. It's something much deeper. It yeah. is a cultural expression of being at home and with your family or, or, or your friends and expressing these different emotions or whatever. I mean, I haven't attended the whole symposium and who am I? I'm nobody. But, I'm just saying there's, there's two things yeah. to everybody. I don't know. I've, I've been a bartender for 20 years, and I would liken it to having to wear low cut and show off my cleavage. Like, I don't do that in my day-to-day -day -day life, and you kind of have to, to make the tips. And I, that's, if I can choose not to do that in flamenco, I choose not to, which is, like, that's, and that's my, that's for me. I, that's, that feels the same way. I feel as, like, I don't know. It feels... Objectified. Yeah. Okay. On that note, <laughs> yes, that's, that's it. Good. Good. Woo.